it's been interesting because it seems like, I'm not going to say the theme, but the kind of overarching um, continuation, I guess I would say. Because, you know, at first we started talking about this great big God that we have, that's the God of the creator of the heavens and the universe, and, and all that there is was created by him and through him. And then we kind of narrowed it down to God the Son coming and doing the work on our behalf on the cross and uh, um, seeing how God worked through Jesus for the acts of redemption. And then we see the ascension. He said, hey, it's better for you that I go, that I'm going to send one just like me. And then we kind of talked about the Holy Spirit and his work and role in us um, as kind of our Emmanuel today. He's kind of our God with us now and, and what he's doing. to be kidding me. I'm red again. <laughs> Can you grab a couple batteries for me if you would? say it sounded like it changed so anyways um, it's this is one of the ones as we learn about this that I find myself I really have to take a lot of this by faith because it's just almost more than I can comprehend it just is it, it when when we start to think about the life of God the very life of God dwelling in us it's 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 it starts pushing circuit breakers to start popping i'm telling you and so you know the scripture we're going to be hanging around today is a very very common scripture it's quoted quite often um, sometimes i think it's not quoted accurately or in the right context maybe the word would be um, so we're going to go to john 10 verses 7 through 11 and this is Jesus speaking. It's red letters. So Jesus went over it again. I speak to you eternal truth. Now just wrap your head around this a little bit. He's talking to the Pharisees, who are the people that supposedly represent God on the earth. Okay. And Jesus is telling them, I speak to you eternal truth. I am the gate for the flock. All those who broke in before me are thieves who came to steal. But the sheep never listened to them. I am the gateway to enter through me is to experience life, freedom, and satisfaction. A thief has only one thing in mind he wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. 
But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. I am the good shepherd who lays down my life as a sacrifice for the sheep. So here Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, but I want to go and look at the scriptures prior to that because it sets up this scripture. So this is John 10, 1, and, and I like this because it, it clearly tells us who's speaking and who they're speaking to, okay? It says, Jesus said to the Pharisees, listen to this eternal truth. He's trying to get them to see something here. Okay. The person who sneaks over the wall to enter into the sheep pen, rather than coming to the gate, reveals himself as a thief coming to steal. But the true shepherd walks right up to the gate, and because the gatekeeper knows who he is, he opens the gate to let him in. And the sheep recognize the voice of the true shepherd, for he calls his own by name and leads them out for they belong to him. And when he has brought out all his sheep, he walks ahead of them and they will follow him, for they are familiar with his voice. But they will run away from strangers and never follow them because they knew, because they know it's not the voice of a stranger. Jesus told the Pharisees this parable, even though they didn't understand a word of what he meant. See, and... and that's the sad part of, of a religious mindset because we know that scripture tells us that when the law is spoken of, a veil is placed over the eyes. Okay? And um, so here Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He's trying to get them to understand who he is. They're still trying to figure out who this Jesus is, okay? Um, and why he was there. Why he came. Why is this person? Because you have to remember, in that time, there were other Jesuses that showed up. But see, none of them were able to do the miracles. None of them could be verified or, or given the credit that Jesus had because of the miracles that he performed. And, and so this new person, Jesus, now is doing different things than the last year, the bar Jesus, they would call him, um, and, and so he's, he's trying to get the leaders, because if you're going to try and get a message out, you would go to the leadership, because people are following the leadership. And that's what Paul said, hey, when I go into a city, the first place I go is to the temple. And I try and convince them in the temple about this truth, and then generally they reject me, and then I go to the Gentiles. And because if, if you can get the leadership to adhere to, believe in, and follow a, a teaching or a truth, then they will teach that to the followers. But it's so sad because it says they didn't understand a word of what he meant. Because they were veiled. See, the very minute that he said, I'm telling you an eternal truth, what is it that has eternity attached to it? Well, it's only God. So he's telling him, I'm telling you a truth that's from God, from an eternal being, right? I'm trying to convey to you these truths, and, and so they didn't, have, they didn't have ears to hear or eyes to see. And how many times did Jesus say that? Let those who have ears to hear and eyes to see listen to what I'm saying. And, and they just weren't there. And so um, going back to... trying to say oh so then in verse 7 it says so Jesus went over it again he's persistent just like he is with us when, when the Holy Spirit's trying to teach us something and we don't get it the first time thankfully he's consistent and he's diligent and he's faithful to continue to go over and over and over it again you know, that's why some of you say, well, I've read the Bible, what do I do now? Well, you go over it again. Read it again. And, and just read it again. And so, what's the first thing he says again? 
I speak to you eternal truth. He's really trying to stress this point that these are eternal truths. Don't miss them. Listen to this eternal truth. And what he said in verse 1 and in verse 7, he says, I speak to you eternal truth. And then verse 7 he says, I am the gate, one way to the Father, through the Son. See, they were trying to get to the Father through the law. That was their source of being right and doing right and then obtaining uh, righteousness by their right doing. And so Jesus is trying to get them to see that he's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the one that is the gate to the flock. If they'll listen to him, if you want to be the, the under-shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and deal with your people that God's put under your care, you have to go through Jesus. You don't go through the law. You go through Jesus. You go through these eternal truths. And, and then he starts to get really strong in his... Um, verbiage towards them because think about what he says here now to the pharisees who think that they're in a a right place with god through their doing so verse 80 says all those who broke in before me are thieves who came to steal he's basically telling the pharisees you by not going to me are stealing from the flock you are the ones that are not going through the gate. And so Jesus, as the good shepherd, see, he doesn't steal. The sheep know his voice. And you have to realize that when, when you would go up to a, a sheep pen, there were many shepherd sheep in the pen at night. And so when the, when the shepherd would go up and he would speak, the sheep, his sheep knew his voice because he had been taking them to green pastures and still waters. And so as he would say, hey, you know, whatever his verbiage would be towards his sheep, hey, you knuckleheads, and they'd all, you know. If there's 100 sheep in there and 25 of them belong to him, 25 sheep would come and the other 75 sheep would not even move because it's a... It's a a foreign voice. It's a stranger's voice. And so Jesus, as the good shepherd, cares for us and shows us the loving heart of the Father. He's, he's the good shepherd. And so he's trying to convey to the Pharisees that, listen, I'm the one that's sent to take care of the sheep. And if you'll come through me, you'll be able to tend the sheep as an under-shepherd under me and the sheep will know my voice, and you'll know my voice, and you'll all follow me. You know, that's why as, as, a, as a, a pastor, I see the name still kind of is weird to me. But anyways, you know, you guys come to hear the word of God here. You know, and, and I suppose that scripturally I would be called the shepherd of the, of the sheep. But you're not my sheep. but you're not my sheep. You're the sheep that has allowed me and Elaine and whoever else to, to minister the truths of the word. See, the, the, the voice we need to know is not my voice. Don't get to know my voice. Get to know the Holy Spirit's voice. Get to know your Father's voice because he's the one that will never error where I can, okay? Be like the Bereans and check out everything we say. Don't just take it at face value. I used to be like a bird in a nest, and everything that came over the pulpit, I just swallowed. No longer. No longer. Amen. Um, so Jesus says the gate leads us to the Father and, and to that kingdom realm. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, and so he's trying to convey to the Pharisees this truth um, so in verse 8, he calls this the Pharisees thieves who come to steal. I, I guarantee you that had to sting a little bit because through this whole set of passages, he, he just continues to try and convey to them where they're at in their thinking 
and where they should be in their thinking. The word we would use would be repent. He's trying to get them to repent, to change the way they think. Um, so, Jesus is pointing out to the Pharisees who they are. They are um, hirelings, Scripture would call them. And, you know, prior to the New Covenant, that's what they were tasked to do, was to teach the law. But Jesus is trying to get them to see that this is coming to an end and that we're going to change uh, the dynamics of feeding the sheep. We're no longer going to feed the sheep the law. We're going to feed the sheep grace. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, so then verse 9 says, I am the gateway. To enter through me is to experience life, freedom, and satisfaction. So Jesus tells him who he is. He's the gate. And what is found upon entering him. See, because you have to realize that, that they were trying to find these aspects of life through the law, through religious ceremony, and we know that it can't be found there. The law cannot make one righteous. The law never brought joy. The law never brought peace, and it never brought rest. It always brought striving. And the reason it was designed to do that was to wear us out so that we would throw our hands up and say, that's it. I can't do this. You know, that's what it says in Galatians. The law was to bring us to Jesus. And, and so, but the Pharisees didn't comprehend that. They thought that through the law, you could be made righteous. So Jesus is trying to show them and relate to them that that's not true I have eternal truth. The law was not a, a system set out for eternity. The law had a time frame that brought us to the cross as a believer. And then once we believed, then we believed the eternal truth of grace. And the law is obsolete for us. Now, I'm not saying that the law isn't eternal. It is. But it's eternal for unbelievers. But the minute they become a believer, the minute they come and enter through the gate, the law becomes obsolete. And now what they find when they've set down the law and pick up grace is they experience life. Okay? And this word, this is one of the words that is zoe. See, everybody in this context that Jesus was talking to had life. They were all alive, okay? They had all been born. But there's a different life that Jesus was trying to convey to them, and it's this eternal life. It's a zoe life. It's a, and, and the other thing, when you come through this gate, is you experience freedom. See, and there is no freedom in the law. There's zero freedom in the law, and there's zero freedom in religion. Because religion is about you, and you have to produce your own freedom. Well, we can't do that. I've tried. Trust me, it doesn't work. And the last thing he says is that we are to experience satisfaction. And, and this is really a, a wonderful place to get to in life is when you're satisfied with who you are and where you are at the moment. Even though it might not be where you want to be, but you're satisfied, you can enter into rest that God has got us, he's, he's going to take us to that place and be satisfied because in the satisfaction and in the rest, depression has to go, anxiety has to go, frustration has to go because it, it's, it's not given any fertile ground to grow because satisfaction is satisfied. It doesn't need anything else at the moment. Now, we may have things that we're striving towards, but at the moment, we're at rest with where we're at. And it's a wonderful place, and religion hates it when you're there because then you don't need it any longer. Amen? And, um, and so these are all things that religion or the law can't offer us. Um, 
So we're going to go to um, John 5.39. This is a few verses later. It says, you search and keep on searching and examining the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And yet, it is to those very scriptures that testify about me, and still you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have Zoe. See, this is just a few verses later talking to the same group of people, still trying to convey to them how hard-hearted they are and how stiff-necked they are. It says, you search the scriptures, which is, was their job. That's what they did. They searched the scriptures, learned the scriptures, and then taught from the scriptures. He says, you search the scriptures, searching and examining the scriptures, because you think that in them you have eternal life. Once again, he's trying to show them the Zoe of God is not brought out through the law. It's not there. You could keep all 613 of the laws, and in the end, not have Zoe. You'd have earthly life, but you would not have Zoe life. And yet, it is those very scriptures that testify about me, and still you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. And of course, back in the day, he would have been speaking not English, he would have said the word Zoe. And they would have known exactly what he meant. Because the first one that says that, that you have eternal life is, because remember, we are eternal creatures. Okay? And so we have eternal life as far as our existence staying alive. Now, we're not all going to live here on this planet because we die and then go into what we would call eternity. And those that haven't believed and have Zoe life are going to live on. But those that die with Zoe life get to enjoy the Zoe life of God. And so what he's saying is, hey, you're going to live eternally with life, but you're not going to live eternally with the life that I bring, the Zoe life. And that's why he says that, and, uh, that you may have Zoe and the amazing part about that is, as we sit here today as a believer, one that's confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you and I possess this Zoe life. The very life of God lives in us. Okay? And that's why the scripture says that in us, we, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. Scripture tells us that the fullness of the Godhead lives in us bodily. Well, just through the natural train of thought is, if God is living in me, then Zoe has to be in me. Because you cannot separate God from the life of God. Amen? And, and this is where I have to stop and pause and say, all right, Holy Spirit, you're going to have to convey, convince, uh, uh, help me to really grab a hold of that because it's bigger than I can understand. That the very life of the creator that created all things and holds all things together now resides in me. Because when I start to believe that, I start to think differently about my life. I do, because if, if this dynamo... This, this dynamic of God lives in me, then, then what am I doing with it or what am I allowing it to do with me? Right? What, what am I, what am I uh, um, relinquishing to it and what am I allowing it to um, do in my life? Uh, see, this is one of the reasons if you ever... As you listen to me, I really bag on religion. I just do. I don't, I don't point out any particular religion because I don't think that's necessary. 
but it's religion as a whole. Anything that tries to convey to you and I that we are part of our salvation experience that we need to somehow create a righteousness by works or by deeds, by doing or not doing, um, it, it's such a, a slap in the face of the cross. And, and so what happens is religion will tell you, well, yeah, uh, we'll agree that, that you know, God lives in you, but if you sin, uh, then he moves out. And, and then you repent, and then he moves back in. But that's everything against what Jesus told the disciples. He said, hey, listen, I'm going to go, and I'm going to send the one just like me, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Amen. And we need to rest in that fact that God is okay with us because he being the Alpha and the Omega, he knew exactly what each of our days existed or uh, encountered. And how we would respond to things, whether we responded it to it by speaking life over the situation or speaking death over the situation. See, you know, we've talked about how no longer for a believer is it about sinning and not sinning. It's about choosing life or choosing death. Because we're going we're gonna to get to our pillow that night, either choice. It's just what did our day have hold? What did we allow in? And when we have realized that this Zoe life lives in us see really what it comes down to is are we going to let the thief come and steal our joy he can't steal the zoe of god from us we're sealed by the holy spirit but if we start to think um that that there's another gate or another way or another process to walking uprightly before god we uh take ourselves to a bad place to a place of unbelief really is what it is. Um, and so that scripture says is the thief only has one thing in mind. He wants to, he desires to steal. And I, that word kill, which normally we hear, the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And a lot of times people say the thief is the devil. Okay? But you can clearly say in this context that it's religion. It's what the Pharisees were teaching. Now, who is behind that lie? Well, the father of lies, of course, you know. So in essence, he is involved in it. He is the one that desires for not, us not to walk in the fullness of the things of God. But he uses religion as the tool to do it. And, and so it's not, there's generally not a, a, a devil under every rock, but sometimes there's religion under every rock. And religion is one of the hardest things that you'll ever try and get free from. Because it, it, it makes sense to the natural mind. But our spiritual man goes, no, that's not a good gate. Amen. And so um, this word thief says the thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to, he wants to or he desires to steal, slaughter, and destroy. And, and this word thief uh, in the Greek means an embezzler. A pilferer, I kind of like that word, false teacher are those who abuse men's confidence. See, and if you think about the last two, a false teacher and those who abuse men's confidence, what is it that religion will do? It will make you be unconfident in your Christian life in whatever arena that, that it is, whether you're, you're in need of a touch from God in your body and religion makes you think, well, you know, you haven't been living up rightly and so God, you know, you're probably going to have to do something uh, to get right with God so that he'll touch you, that he'll heal you or that he'll meet your needs. And once again, that's why I just detest religion because it's, it's such a falsehood and it's such a lie and it puts people in such bondage because it, it's, it's a hireling. It's, it's a false teacher. Amen. And, and the sad part is you, and, and I used to do this. To be honest, I would take scripture 
and, and teach it as if it was for today. And it was obsolete for a believer. But I, 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 I wasn't at where I'm at now. I was confused. Amen? My, my confidence was never there. I was never sure of what I was doing. And so that's why a lot of times when we run across people that love the Lord, they're born again, they attend church on Sunday, and they go to Bible studies, and they go out and witness and share. So often they're confused. Uh, I was talking to a gal yesterday, and, and, you know, bless the people. Well, where do you stand on the rapture? Where do you stand on your salvation? Let's start at ground zero and work from there. I mean, if we want to get into some of the tributary things, you know what I mean? And, and I shared with her my belief on, on the rapture, but I brought it back to, hey, let's look at this wonderful, loving God. When we get everything else, when we get all the weeds out of our garden, then let's plant another seed. But until we get this garden weeded, let's not worry about planting something else. We've got other work to do. And, and, you know, like we talked about Wednesday night, when, when stuff is presented in love, it's received. You know? And we had a wonderful conversation. I steered it away from that. I spoke to it, but I steered it away from that and started going into... Hey, do you understand that the very life of God lives in you? When, when you realize that the Zoe of God is living in you, that rapture thing is going to take care of itself. Right? But the devil's got you off over here, or religion got you over here, focused on something that's not even of necessity right now in your life. Let's go back to the main thing. And, and so in, in verse 10b... In, in, uh, he says, but I have come. See, any time you read that, when, when Jesus says what his reason is for doing something, we ought to pay close attention to it because who is he doing it for? All of humanity, right? It says, but I have come to give you everything in abundance. More than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. I'm ready for all of that, right? Sign me up, amen. But see, I'm already signed up. I don't have to be signed up. I just have to start recognizing it, realizing the reality of it, and, and then applying it to my everyday life. Really, I mean, if you think about it. Um, and so we have to remember that, that he's speaking eternal truth. So Jesus came to give us everything in abundance. And the Greek word there is prisio, and it means over and above, more than is necessary, and super added. That's why scripture says we lack no good thing. He's given us all things pertaining to life. That's our earthly life. That's that one that our mother gave us. And godliness, that is our spiritual life. And we're supplied abundantly in both arenas. But we have to learn it and walk in it and speak it and proclaim it and, and expect it. Do we expect these things to happen in our life? I'm getting better at it because I no longer use me as a determiner whether it should show up or not. See, when I was in the mixture and kind of walking between law and grace and, and the mixture, I was confused because I didn't know if I had deserved it, earned it, or if it was by grace and grace alone. And so I oscillated back and forth, and the scripture says, hey, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, right? And so we just have to realize that it's over and above so if you ask for five, probably eight are coming. Because it's over and above. Over and above. More than is necessary. Super added. So I, scripture tells us that he's given us um, enough for ourselves and enough for every good work. See, that's the over and above. When you have your needs met and you can now meet other people's needs. 
That's the over and above. That's the super added, more than necessary. The next one is more than you expect. And that's why I said, where's our expector at? What are we expecting to receive from God? Just enough to get by? Just enough to get us to our destination? Or are we going to be able to assist and, and help people along the way? You know, um, Ephesians 3.20 In the Amplified says, now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power that is at work within us. More than we ask or think. Then in... in um, the Amplified, it says, oh, let me get here. Did I not get my passion one in here? The passion one's on there, isn't it, Tim? Oh, here it is right here. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination, he will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. You know, and, and it is. That, that's a promise to us. But, but are we going to believe it, first of all? Does it seem too good to be true? Because sometimes that's where we're at. It just seems too good to be true that, that we can put our expectors way out there and expect God to meet the needs outside of how we're doing. See, that's usually what happened with me before is, is I would disqualify myself from this truth because I had said something to my wife, I had neglected to do something, whatever the, this, what I felt disqualified me was. And then I realized I, I'm not the one that qualified me, Jesus qualified me. The good shepherd is the one that's going to bring it to pass. And then the last part of this is life in its fullness until you overflow. Out of you will pour rivers of living water. Well, where's that living water coming from? The Zoe of God. The life of God pours out of us. If we'll let it, if we don't stifle it, if we believe it's in there and wants to come out, um, so this word Zoe life is kind of interesting. It says a life that is real and genuine. And as all of you know, if you have ever walked in religion for any length of time, it's all masks. It's all hypocritical. You'll never be honest with yourself or the people around you. It was a sad day when I had to go to church and lie just to be accepted. If I would have went in and said, you know what, I had the crappiest week. I think God's left me and forsaken me. I don't even know if I'm saved. Oh, brother, where are your faith? Blah, blah, blah. And, they, and they'd beat you up with the scriptures and slay you down to the floor. And, and then they'd just leave you lay there. And so you drive up in the parking lot and put your mask on and walk in. Oh, praise the Lord, brother, overcomer, we got it all. You know, and, and you're hurting inside, and you walk out of there. Yeah, I mean, and, and then the sad reality is the message you'd hear would almost make you feel worse. Like, dang, I shouldn't have come today. I feel worse now. You aren't doing it right. You need to stop this. Da 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 da. da. And you know what? I, I at one point taught that way. I'm so thankful I can teach grace, the truth of the Scripture, eternal truth. Amen. And so, a life active and vigorous. I think I got that one going. <laughs> I think that one's in gear. A life that comes directly from God. And see, this is where you really have to put your, your faith out there. That you and I have this Zoe, this life that comes directly from God. We, we are these earthen vessels filled with this mighty gift. Amen. And And... And like I said, I have to walk by faith in that because it's almost more than I can believe. You know, so our mothers gave us physical birth. Jesus gave us Zoe life, spiritual life, a God-breathed life. 
If you, if you look back, when God made Adam, he took the dust of the earth, he formed him, and he breathed into him his life, the life of God. The word is ruach, it's life. It's when, when Adam came alive. God, and, and when Adam sinned, the, the earthly life remained, but it decayed and died, but the zoe of God is what left, okay? And so when Adam sinned, sin removed zoe. And, but it's interesting that second Adam, when sin was removed at the cross, what was able to return? Zoe life. So sin removed Zoe, but sin removed brought back Zoe to those that believe it and receive it. That's what being born again is. You know, when we died with Christ and that old man died we were raised again, a brand new creation, alive in Christ. Well, what is it that made us alive? The Zoe of God, the very life of God. Like I said, it's, it's almost more than a person can really comprehend. It really is. It's, 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 I'm working on it. So it's interesting because I wrote down, let's not miss one of God's most crucial benefits of Christianity his vital spiritual life changing our existence. We're brand new creation. We're a, we're a creation that had never been before until we got born again. A brand new creation, one that now contains the very Zoe of God. So we knew in the Old Testament that they said, hey, uh, where's God? Well, he's over there in the temple, right? But under the new covenant, if you came and said, hey, where's God? He's in the, still in the temple. But not a temple made by hands, okay? God cleansed this temple, spotlessly cleaned it, and then came and resides in it. Amen? And, and so this new creation that we have contains the Zoe of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is very clear. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is, grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he is a new creature, born and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition, have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings a new life. I mean, it's just very clear. We're, we're new creations in Christ Jesus. And it brings new Zoe. The Zoe of life comes back to us. And that's why sin has been dealt with, and it doesn't affect the Zoe of, life, of God. It just doesn't. Um, we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. John, 1 John 5, 12 and 13. He who has the Son, by accepting him as Lord and Savior, has the life that is eternal. He who does not have the Son of God, by personal faith, does not have the life. See, it's very clear. You know, people that, that, that think that everybody's saved, this scripture just debunks that right there. It says that if you have received Christ by Savior, you have life. You have Zoe. But if you haven't, if you haven't put personal faith in, you don't have life. It's just true. Um, and then verse 13 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, which represents all that Jesus is and does, so that you will know with settled and absolute knowledge that you already have eternal life. John wanted us to know that we can be secure in our salvation. We don't need to wonder about it. We don't need to uh, fret about it. We don't, shouldn't listen to anybody that says that, that you don't have it. Because here he wants us to know that this Zoe belongs to us. I wrote down, no son, no Zoe. 
The sad part is, is we see a lot of believers, like I said earlier, walking around with Zoe residing in them, but because of lack of understanding, they're not able to put into use this dynamo. I've, I've always kind of related it to a car. Imagine that. So, so you know, you have this car, and it has the motor, and it all works, but you go out, and you put it in neutral, and you push the car. Now, you can make the car move, depending on the size of the car and the terrain that it's on. You can get the car to move, but it's, it's hard work. Okay, a lot of Christians, that's how they're living their Christian life. They're, they're, they're not getting in, taking the key, starting the dynamo, and letting life move you. Letting the Holy Spirit be the power that, that propels us <clears throat> to live a Christian life. I mean, live, trying to be a Christian without the Holy Spirit is impossible. Because you can't do it. Amen? And, and so... It's just hard because you see people struggling all the time and they're in doubt and unbelief about this wonderful, loving God, whether he's going to come through for them. Amen? And so, um, you know, Scripture tells us nothing can separate us from the love of God. So, I'm going to finish up. It says, Jesus came that we would have spiritual life that overflows. More than enough for ourselves, enough for every good work. Reaching every part of our human spirit. It'll reach every part of our soul realm, our mind, our will, and our emotions. It will reach this, this, this life, will reach every part of our physical body. Because we're a, we're a composite whole. As a believer, we can't separate our spirit, our body, and our soul. We're a composite whole. And this Zoe life came... And it affects all of us, the whole being. And the last thing is it reaches every part of our finances, our relationship, and everything we do. It should be the dynamo. It should be that power behind us that, that affects everything we do. So God's Zoe life is intended to influence every aspect of our human life. Because too often... We find people that are just really spiritual. But unfortunately, they're really disconnected from general life itself. You know, the old saying is so, so spiritual that you're of no earthly good. You know, and, and it's funny because you and I have met people that, that everything is spiritual. And you try and just have a normal conversation with them, and it's very <laughs> difficult. You know, and... and that's not a balance. We shouldn't be unbalanced. And this Zoe life of God that belongs to us, given to us freely, and it should be what affects every area of our mind, our will, our emotions, our physical body. That's why when, when we stop and think that, that Jesus on the cross paid for our physical body's repair, what it has need of. And when that Zoe of God came in, it, it affects everything if we'll let it. You know, and, and that's one of the things I found out about the truth of the scriptures is if we don't know it, it's not going to be of value to us because we don't know it, okay? The next thing is we can know it but not apply it. We can know it but not apply it to our situation. And, and so, as a teacher, that's what I enjoy doing is, is teaching the truths of the scriptures so that at a minimum we know what they are. I can't make you guys apply them. That's up to you. That's like the other day I was, I was teaching and it said that, that God wants us to understand and experience these truths. And that's my heart's desire is that you and I would get a hold of these truths and allow them to work in us. And, and it, if you're like I am, I have to walk away from a teaching like this and go sit at the feet of the teacher. 
and have him expound what all this meant. Because it's bigger than, than we can grasp in a 45-minute teaching. But because the eternal spirit has these eternal truths, and it's his calling as our teacher. He's our teacher, he's our comforter, he's our guide, he's the one called. He's like going and sitting with Jesus on the side of the mountain and Jesus teaching. When we go sit and say, Holy Spirit, and that was a lot of stuff. Can you break that down for me and give me that in bite-sized pieces? And just allow him to minister this truth to us. Amen? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning as we've stopped and looked at your word. And once again, the amazingness of what you've done on our behalf. How you've supplied us so abundantly with everything that we have need of. And that we lack no good thing. And we thank you that within us you have replaced that, that dead spirit that had enmity between you because of sin with this brand new Zoe life that comes directly from you. And that's why when we go from this life to that life, it's a, it's a seamless transition because everything we have in us fits right into where we're going. There's no place where we have to stop and change clothes because what you've clothed us in is the clothing of the kingdom. And we're thankful that it's a work that you do, you continue to do, you're faithful to do, you're committed to do as we diligently seek you. So I bless my brothers and sisters this morning as they uh, take in this, this scripture, these teachings, this tr eternal truth. Holy Spirit, that you continue to minister to us, that we could walk and talk and live in these truths. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Father, for the food, the fellowship, and the fun that we have around it. If anybody needs prayer, come and see me or see somebody. Don't leave without being prayed for. We'll agree with you on what God's word says about your circumstance. Amen. Love you guys. Have an awesome day. You're the best God's got.